Good morning, everybody. Welcome to our program for this morning. We look forward to a very fine lesson on acids and bases. We extend a special welcome to many of the schools who joined us for this online winter school tutor program. I notice in the attendance box the following schools, Biran High School, Cravenby High School, Manzomtombo High School, Alsis River, Inquenquesi, Masi Bambisani, and if I haven't mentioned your name and you're a school that's online, please feel free to know that you are most welcome to our program for this morning. We're really going to go through a very important section in paper two, namely acids and bases, and we look forward to this interactive program that lies ahead of us. Okay. Now, just to mention to you grade 12 learners, the way our program this morning is structured is we're going to be going through some very important points. And at certain points in our presentation, I would like to hear from you by means of your comments what the answer to my question really is. You'll notice that the main points will be on the entire program. In other words, if you look at the screen, you should have the answer right there. So keep following very nicely as we're going along, all right? And so we're going to go through this and really enjoy this together. Okay, so as I mentioned, our program this morning is on acids and bases. May I also just say at this stage, Ase Matle, good morning. Can you hear me? Good morning, sir. Yes, I can. Okay, fine. Ase Matle, I, you know, I get so carried away in what I'm doing. <laughs> as you guys so well know. Um, yes, sir. If there is a question from a school, okay, yes, um, I'm going to <clears throat> stop my presentation and say, Asi Markley, do we have a question from the audience? Yes, And sir. then you can either say, yes, we've got this question and tell me the question, or we've got no, or no, there's no question, and I'll move on, okay? Yes, sir. Actually, um, Buren High School has their hand up, so oh, if they can just uh, unmute their mics, then they can speak. Okay, great. Okay, wow, Buren is already firing away. <laughs> That's nice. Excellent. Okay. Hey, Buren, seeing that you know, you have a question, let, give me the answer now. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so once again, everybody, welcome to our program. We're really looking forward to going through this very important section in paper two, namely acids and bases. Now, grade 12 is just a little bit of a backdrop here. In grade 11, acids and bases was taken up in your curriculum. Now, we know in 2020, with COVID-19 and the uncertain times and the trimming of the curriculum, probably you didn't spend too much time on this section, which is a great pity. Because, you know, honestly, this is such an exciting section in physical sciences, right? And the theory that we're going to be going through today is not just cold, boring theory. I want you to remember that. It is interesting information that affects our everyday lives. And you'll see as we go through our program this morning how that will really start taking shape in your minds as well. Okay? Now, when we move forward with our program here. Let's just go oh there. Uh, okay, there we go. Right. So how is our program today going to be designed? Well, similar to our program on Monday, you remember we did that program on electrostatics, and I'm sure grade 12s, you went home and you really mulled over. In other words, you went over those important points in paper one that we spoke about, right, on electrostatics. The same format is going to be taken. We're going to start by an explanation by the tutor. Now, I am not going to be doing all the talking, as I've just mentioned. There are going to be questions that I'm going to ask you. And please don't feel, please don't feel embarrassed if you give the wrong answer. That is actually scientific. There are wrong answers. You know, I, just find me those teachers who say there's no such thing as a wrong answer. There are wrong answers. And you know, even Einstein, Albert Einstein, his answers were wrong. 
But you know what? He helped us on the path to scientific truth. And so we want you to really progress by means of this lesson. All right? If you hit it spot on, well done. And of course, if your answer's off center, I'm not going to say, oh, no, wrong, whatever. No, no, no. I, you know, we will take it in your stride. So don't be embarrassed. Okay? So explanation by the tutor, we will go through our subject matter. Then part B, we're going to have a worksheet that is going to be completed by you learners. Okay? And then part C, we'll have the marking of the worksheet by the tutor. Now, just to look at part B again, what we're going to do, everybody, part of part A, when we get to our worksheet, you're not going to do all those questions yourself. I'm going to help you by going through each one, but you're going to be giving me some very important answers, especially the ones that relate to the definitions and the conceptual understanding of acids and bases. All right? And then we'll see how it goes. And then perhaps the last two questions, we'll make you work on them. We'll give you some time, and then you can work on them, and then we'll mark the worksheet by the tutor, as mentioned there in part C. All right, so we're all ready to go. Let's first and foremost start off by looking at what do the examination guidelines mention in connection with acids and bases. You know, grade 12s, it's a very important part to start any, any, any section in physical sciences because the examination guidelines are the guidelines that the examining panel looks at when they are setting a final paper. They look at the guidelines and they say the learners throughout the country should have done this. The learners should know this. How much more so? Have you ever wondered how can you get tips for your final exam? Here they are, the examination guidelines. We first, as you can see on the screen, going to look at acid-base reactions. We're going to look at two models, the Arrhenius model of an acid and a base, and then the lowry bronsted theory of an acid and a base. Then, as you can see, the next subheading we're going to consider is the relative strengths of acids and bases. What is a strong acid? What is a weak acid? What is a strong base? What is a weak base? What is meant by a concentrated acid or a concentrated base? Well, what do we mean when we talk of a dilute acid or a dilute base? Look out for those points. They're very important. Then we move on. We're going to look at acid-base reactions. And you may remember from your previous studies in physical sciences that these are called neutralization reactions. Do you remember that term? Neutralizations. In other words, when acid reacts with the base, it results in a neutralizing of a product. Very important. Then we're going to consider hydrolysis. Now, as you can see from the first line there, hydrolysis is the reaction of a salt with water. Very important. And then that introduces this concept, pH. Now, you've heard of pH before, right? The pH scale determines the acidity or the alkalinity of a substance, whether a substance is very acidic or whether it's very alkaline. And we know that pH of 7 means that it's absolutely neutral. All right. Then we're going to move on to something which is taken up in grade 12. And in the second term, it's actually a, pre a prescribed practical investigation. This is called acid-base titrations. Seems to be a big word, but it's not too big for Wednesday morning, I can assure you that. <laughs> Especially at winter school. Titrations. Okay, and we're going to look at certain concepts in connection with this. We are concerned with at which point does the acid neutralize the base? Oh, that's a fascinating practical investigation, right? The titration. Now, look out for that. And then we're going to consider pH and the pH scale. We're also going to have a look at calculations in connection with pH and how all of that plays off. For our benefit. So we are all ready to go forward with our program. Let's first start off with what we know from grade seven, eight, nine properties of acids and bases. Firstly, 
acids have a sour taste. Acids turn blue litmus red, that's litmus paper, by the way, and acids increase the concentration of the hydrogen ions. Do you notice that? The H plus ion is known as the hydrogen ion in a solution. And they decrease the concentration of the hydroxide ion. The chemical formula for the hydroxide ions is the OH minus ions in solution. Now, certain textbooks also use, I notice here in South Africa, they also use hydroxyl. There's no problem with that. That's international. That's fine. No problem. So you can say hydroxide or hydroxyl ions in a solution. And they have a pH value. Acids have a pH value of less than 7. In fact, the closer they come to zero, the more acidic or the stronger acidic they become. Have you got those points? There they are. Acids turn blue litmus paper red. They increase the concentration of the H plus ions or the hydrogen ions in solution. They decrease the concentration of the hydroxide or OH ions in a solution. And they have a pH of much less than seven. Great. Now we've got that. Let's have a look at the bases. Okay. Now, bases taste bitter and they have a soapy feel. I want to stop here for a moment. Think of what you may have at home in your kitchen. When you wash your dishes after a meal, you probably use sunlight liquid, right? Have you ever felt sunlight liquid? It's very soapy, not so. In fact, in water, it becomes all very foamy and very soapy. That's a classic example of a base. Also in your kitchen, perhaps you have Handy Andy. It's a very good detergent, right? Kills germs and keeps the place nice and clean. That's also very, very soapy, right? Now, Handy Andy has got ammonia inside. And there is, you'll see later on in our program, a very strong base. So there we go. So bases taste bitter and they have a soapy feel. Bases turn red litmus paper blue. Can you see the contrast between acids and bases? Whereas acids, as you can see on the left-hand side, turn blue litmus paper red. Bases turn red litmus paper blue. And bases have a pH value of more than 7. So remember, 7 is neutral on the pH scale, but as you become a pH of 8, a pH of 9, a pH of 10, a pH of 11, 12, very alkaline, right? So what do bases do? Bases decrease the concentration of the hydrogen ions in a solution. And they increase the concentration of the hydroxide ions in a solution. Okay, fine. So let me ask you this question. Let's get some comments from you. Okay, from Biran, Cravenby, Manzom Tombo, Elsie's River, Inkwenkwezi, Masi Bambisani, anybody in the audience. I say, Martley, you need to help me, yeah, to see who puts up their hands. Okay, grade 12s, here's a question for you. How would you describe the pH values of acids? What is your comment? Do we have a hand up, Asim uh, Not yet, sir. Not yet. The pH values of acids, how would you describe that? Put up your hands, don't be shy. Anybody? Nothing, Asim Nothing yet, sir. Okay, great. Well, as you can see, grade 12s, on the left-hand side of the screen, P acids have pH values of less than 7. I'm sure you got that. All right? You were just scared. Don't be shy. Don't be shy. Okay. What about bases? 
What is the pH value of bases? What do you say? Put up your hand. Don't be shy. Right? Nothing, Asim Ashley? Nothing, sir. Okay, great. Well, bases have a pH value of more than seven. There it is, our third point in that box. Okay, fine. No problem. Let's move on. Now we've got those important points. Let's now have a look at the definition for acids and for bases. Now, grade 12s, just a little bit of history here. You know, the Swedish have been very good when it comes to chemistry. And around the year 1887, there was a Swedish chemist whose name was Savante Arrhenius. Arrhenius was his surname. And he proposed, or he put forth, the following definition of an acid, which today is known as the Arrhenius theory of an acid, the Arrhenius theory of a base. There you see it on the screen. Arrhenius theory of an acid explains acids and bases when dissolved in water. He noticed that water splits up or disassociates into hydronium. Now that's like a hydrogen ion, but it's H3O plus. You probably remember that from grade 10. Hydronium and hydroxide ions according to the following reaction. Notice there's water and it's in a liquid state. That's why there's an L in brackets there. Then we have reversible reaction signs. All right, so remember the reactant is water. It's in its liquid format and that splits up into or dissociates. We must use the term dissociates into the H3O plus ion and that's in its aqueous format because it's diluted and into the hydroxide ion, OH minus, and that's also in its aqueous stage as well. In other words, if you take the left hand, the right hand side, and you add them together, right, you're going to have H2O water. You see the H3 on the right hand side, and the H minus, 3 minus 1 will give you 2. And then the plus and minus will knock each other out. That's why we have H2O. So that's how water dissociates. So he noticed, Arrhenius noticed, that water dissociates into the hydronium ion and the hydroxide ions according to that reaction. So he came up with this definition. And this is an important definition that you must know for your exam. According to the Arrhenius theory, an acid is a substance that produces H plus ions or H3O plus ions in an aqueous solution. Simple, right? We've seen it there in the reaction. What about a base? Well, the Arrhenius theory states that a base is a substance that produces the OH minus ions in an aqueous solution. Great 12s, please remember those definitions. I'm going to ask you in review before we move on to the next slide. Then, working independently, and of course, as the years went on, remember I said that was 1887, and that was in the country of Sweden. That's where Arrhenia stayed. There were two scientists, two chemists for that matter, working independently. One was in Denmark, and his surname was Bronsted. The other one was Lowry, and he was working in England, in Britain, the United Kingdom. And independently, they realized, well, you know what? The Arrhenius theory doesn't really capture the essence of what an acid and a base really is. So they put forth the following theory. In other words, they explained acids and bases in both solid and liquid phases, as mentioned there on the slide. So Bronsted and Lowry broadened the acid-base definition of Arrhenius to not need water because, you know, the truth of the matter is they realized that, look, acids don't have to, and bases don't have to be defined based on what happens in water. So 
they came up with the following, and this is a very important point. In fact, you get two marks for such a short answer in an exam. A Bronsted Lowry acid is an acid which is a proton donor. That's the definition. So the question will be in the exam. Define an acid according to Lonsted, the Lowry Bronsted theory or the Bronsted Lowry. They interchange those names, so it's not too much of a big deal. All right? According to Bronsted Lowry, an acid is a proton donor. In other words, it gives an H plus ion away. And a base is a proton acceptor. Have you got those points? Lowry Bronsted, an acid is a proton donor. A base is a proton acceptor. Very, very important. And so the whole process of proton transfer is seen in the equation shown below. Okay, those are just hypothetical equations. You notice on the left-hand side, the first equation, you have HA plus B. So that compound HA dissociates. In other words, that hydrogen ion, the hydrogen gets away from the A, all right, which leaves the A on the other side as a negative, and then that hydrogen attaches itself to the B, forming an ion. So there you have BH plus plus A minus. Or if you have HA plus B minus, then you have BH as a product being formed plus A minus. And we'll notice how in our program this morning, this plays off in terms of real chemical compounds. So let me ask you this question. This is a question to the audience now. Define an acid according to the Lowry Bronsted theory. What would you say? Two marks. I say, Marshall, tell me if you've got a hand there. A Lowry Bronsted acid. Okay, there's no hand up yet. Okay. Anybody? Don't be shy. Don't be shy. <laughs> All right. So an acid is a proton donor. Right? There we see it on the screen. And a base is a proton acceptor. Okay? What about an Arrhenius acid? Or an acid according to the Arrhenius theory? Well, this is a substance that produces H plus or H3 or plus ions in an aqueous solution. And a base produces OH minus ions in an aqueous solution. All right. So remember those points. You're going to notice how they are going to play off in our program this morning. Now, when acids and bases are in reaction, what forms is acid-base conjugate pairs? Now, you know the word conjugate is a big English word, but it actually means something that we know about every day. It just means its opposite partner. Right? You may look at a restaurant, and there in the restaurant you see two people. You have the one person sitting on this side, other person sitting on that side, and you realize, okay, fine, these are partners. All right? That's what conjugate means. And, of course, that English word is taken further into marriage and so the story. All right, now let's have a look at this as it applies to acid-base pairs. The Lowry-Bronsted theory involves an acid-base protolytic reaction in which a proton transfer takes place. This proton transfer is simultaneous. Therefore, a pair of substances will differ from one another by a proton within an acid-base reaction. This pair is called a conjugate acid-base pair. Now, you're probably saying to yourself, Mr. Goldstone, what are you talking about? There's so many words here. Grade 12s, don't you worry. Let's have a look at how this looks. All we need to remember is when an acid donates a proton, a conjugate base is produced. Have you got that point? So every acid has got its conjugate base. And when a base accepts a proton, a conjugate acid is produced. Very, very important. 
Now, how does this look in reality? Well, here we have a very fine designation on our PowerPoint here. Look at the red acid on the left-hand side. There we have the acid. Now, the acid, right, has its conjugate base. Can you see the blue on the other side? Right, that's its opposite number or its partner, one can say. And look at the base. The base has its conjugate acid. You never have an acid having a conjugate acid. No, 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 no. I've had learners in the past tell me things like that. That's not right. Every acid, get this correct, must have a conjugate base. And every base must have, you got it? I can hear you saying it. It must have a conjugate acid. So there we have that. Do we have that all clear, grade? Twelves, very, very important. And you know, if I may just also say that the study guide that the Department of Basic Education has produced, Mind the Gap, has got a very good outlay in connection with this section as well. So please make sure in your intensive revision, you go through the section in Mind the Gap as well, as well as the answer series, brilliant write-up in connection with acids and bases, and many examples for you to sharpen your skills and to do very, very well in paper two in connection with acids and bases. Now, when a base has accepted a proton, the formed product is called a conjugate acid. We've seen that in our diagram, because it can donate a proton in the reverse reaction again. And when an acid has donated a proton, the remaining compound will be called a conjugate base because it can accept a proton in the reverse reaction. All right, so what do we need to remember from this particular slide? That every acid has got its conjugate base and every base has got its conjugate acid. All right, there we go. Now, let's move on. Let's have a look at examples of conjugate acid base pairs. Right? So there we have our acid. We have water. Then we have hydrochloric acid. Then we have the hydrogen sulfide ion. Then we have the hydrogen phosphide ion. And notice its conjugate base OH minus, Cl minus, SO42 minus, PO43 minus. Right? That's the phosphate ion, the sulfate ion, the chloride ion, right? and the hydroxide or the hydroxyl ion. So every acid will have its conjugate base. Do you notice, grade 12, that from the acid, one hydrogen has been chipped away? Right? It's been donated. So, for example, you can see clearly in the case of hydrochloric acid, right? when the hydrogen in HCl is taken away, what do we get? We simply get a Cl minus. The hydrogen has gone off and it's joined something else. All right? It's donated that to someone else. All right, so what about the bases? There we have water, ammonia, and we have HSO4 minus and SO42 minus. Once again, water, when it donates a hydrogen, becomes the H3O plus. Remember that is the hydronium ion. Some textbooks call it the oxonium ion. It's the same thing. The hydronium ion, H3O+. The NH3, when that donates or accepts, I do beg your pardon, when it accepts a hydrogen, it becomes the ammonium cation. Right? And the HSO4- minus, when it accepts an H plus ion, becomes sulfuric acid. There we have the chemical formula for sulfuric acid. You may remember sulfuric acid is known as battery acid. That's the acid they put in a, a car's battery, right? Sulfuric acid, H2SO4. And the SO4, two minus ion, when it accepts a proton becomes HSO4 minus. We've seen that on the left-hand side. So there we have conjugate acid-base pairs. Now, 
there are certain substances that can react as an acid or a base. One can say as an acid and a base or a base. And these substances are called ampholites. We say that these substances have amphiprotic substances. So these words are big, but they're all one and the same. So once you get your mind and your mouth around them, <laughs> they're all very easy. All right. So what is an ampholite? An ampholite is a substance that can react as an acid or a base. All ampholites have amphiprotic properties. And some textbooks say they have amphoteric properties. No problem. In the presence of a strong acid, an amphiprotic substance reacts as a base. And in the presence of a strong base, an amphiprotic substance reacts as an acid. Right? So we need to keep that in mind as well. And there we have an example. Water plus another water will give us the OH minus ion plus the H3O plus ion. Those are examples, and water is a classic example of a substance that can act as an ampholite. It has amphiprotic or amphoteric properties. Now let's have a look at acid-base reactions. The reaction of an acid and a base, you may know this even from grade 10. In fact, even in grade 8 and grade 9, I noticed here in the South African curriculum, these neutralization reactions occur way back, right, early in the high school phase. Acid plus a base result salt and water. So what are we really talking about? Well, a salt is a compound made up of a metal and a non-metal portion. It is the product of an acid-base reaction where hydrogen in the acid molecule is replaced by a metal cation of the base. So how does this look? Well, let's have a look at this. Here we have a classic example. Notice hydrochloric acid. That's our acid there. Hydrochloric acid reacts with the metal hydroxide. Here we have sodium hydroxide. What is the result? Well, there we have NaCl, which we know is table salt, right? Sodium chloride plus water. And notice the phases. We have aqueous, aqueous, aqueous liquid, right? Here's the question. Is that a homogeneous reaction? or a heterogeneous reaction? Yes, I'm sure Michlali and Mzamo, you know the answer to that, <laughs> right? Obviously, that is a heterogeneous reaction because all the phases are not the same, all right? There's a liquid there, but we have aqueous and all of that. So just keep that in mind as well. So the bottom line is in an acid-base reaction, here we have an acid, plus a metal hydroxide giving us a salt and water. But it doesn't just stop there. Notice this reaction where we have sulfuric acid plus copper oxide, right? What is the result? Well, we're gonna get copper sulfate as well as water. There we have it, right? So do you notice the copper from the copper ox oxide will react with the, sulf the sulfate ion and form the CuSO4, and then the H2 plus the oxygen will form the water. So the acid reacting with the base will resolve with the, to a salt and water. Very important reaction. Then another type of reaction, under the same umbrella of acid-base reactions, is we could have an acid with a metal carbonate. Here we have sodium hydrogen carbonate, that's a solid reacting with hydrochloric acid, HCl. And there, that gives rise to salt plus water plus carbon dioxide. You may remember in grade 10, there were all these reactions that were sketched for you there. And then finally, and the next one, we have an acid plus a metal hydrogen carbonate. Once again, we have hydrochloric acid reacting with magnesium hydrocarbon. Okay, and there we have the reaction right there, and that results in magnesium chloride plus two moles of water plus two moles of carbon dioxide. Once again, that's an example of a heterogeneous reaction because we have gases, liquid, aqueous solutions, solids, and so on. So all those phases are not the same. 
All right, understandably so because of these reactions. And then perhaps one of the easiest, and we've seen a reaction like this in the second term when you did reaction rate. Do you remember that? When you have zinc that is immersed in hydrochloric acid, dilute hydrochloric acid. And of course, you studied about the Maxwell Boltzmann distribution curve and so on. The bottom line is that reaction there was one of those that came up for scrutiny. All right. And you study that. OK, so there we have two moles of hydrochloric acid aqueous. Right. So that's dilute plus zinc solid results in zinc chloride plus hydrogen gas. Very, very interesting. All right. And those questions resulted in that. Now we're looking at the same reaction through the lens of acid base reactions. These are all neutralization reactions. OK, so please make sure that you go through this. This is very, very important. Let's now talk about acid base strengths. Well, the strength of an acid or a base refers to the extent of ionization or dissociation that takes place in a solution. Acids are molecular structures, covalent structures at that, which will undergo ionization. Bases are ionic structures, which will undergo dissociation. Have you got that point? So when you have covalent chemical structures, they always ionize in solution. But ionic structures or structures that are bonded with ionic bonding, they undergo dissociation reactions. So here we have our two processes. Ionization, here we have, this is the chemical process where covalent molecules produce ions in solution. And dissociation is the chemical process where ionic compounds produce ions in solution. And so the strength of an acid or a base refers to the extent of ionization or dissociation that takes place in a solution. So have a look at these four, strong acids, strong bases, weak acids, weak bases. Look at how we fill up these different boxes. Strong acids, here's the definition of a strong acid. Make sure you know this, everybody, because this is important. A strong acid ionizes completely in solution to form a high concentration of H3O plus ions. What are examples of strong acids? It's always good to know about three examples, two or three. Hydrochloric acid, sulfuric acid, and nitric acid. Very important. Have you got that point? Strong acids, the definition of a strong acid an acid that ionizes completely in solution to form a high concentration of H3O plus ions. So the minute you see HCl, the minute you see H2SO4, the minute you see nitric acid, HNO3, you must know that those are strong acids. What about weak acids? Well, the contrast is true. Weak acids ionize incompletely in solution to form a low concentration of H3O plus ions. Examples, ethanoic acid. There we have the chemical formula, ch 3 c -O -H. Of course, ethanoic acid, as we know, is commonly known at home as vinegar, right? Ethanoic acid, right? It's also called acetic acid. It's the same thing. Acetic acid, ethanoic acid, and vinegar, one and the same thing. They're all three terms for the same compound. Then hydrofluoric acid, phosphoric acid, right? So hydrofluoric acid, HF, or phosphoric acid, H3PO4. Those are weak acids. Why are they weak acids? Because they ionize incompletely to form a low concentration of H3O plus ions in solution. What about our strong bases? Well, strong bases dissociate completely in solution to form a high concentration of hydroxide ions. Examples are sodium hydroxide, potassium hydroxide, lithium hydroxide. 
Now, just look at those three examples that are given there, grade 12s. Do you notice sodium, potassium, lithium? Do you remember from the periodic table, they all found in group one, right? Group one. And so those alkali metals in group one, that's what they were called in grade 10, you remember that? On the periodic table. When they bond, when they react to form with the hydroxide ions, they form very strong bases, all right? And these strong bases dissociate completely in solution to form a high concentration of hydroxide ions. And there we have our three examples. What about weak bases? Well, our weak bases dis dissociate incompletely in solution to form a low concentration of hydroxide ions. And here we have ammonium hydroxide, calcium hydroxide, and magnesium hydroxide, All right? Here we've had our definition of strong acids and our definition of strong bases, weak acid and weak bases. So, in review, let me ask you this question. This is a question to the audience. Let's hear your comments. I hope we have a hand now. Would someone like to tell us what is the definition of a strong acid? I say, Marshley, please tell me if we have a hand there. Strong acid. How would you define a strong acid? Don't be shy, grade 12. This is an interactive session, remember? No hand yet. Okay. Anybody? Don't be shy. Looks like there's a hand up from, okay. oh, where did the hand go? From Masibambisane High All right. School. Go ahead. Um, where did it go? Okay. Don't be shy. Biren had the hand up right at the start. <laughs> <laughs> So, right. Ms. Bambisane, you can unmute your mic and you can ask your question. A strong acid ionizes completely in a solution to form a high concentration of hydrogen ions. Outstanding. Well done. Well done. Well done. Well done. Ms. Bambisane. Outstanding. Well done. Let me ask you this question. What is the definition of a strong base? Come on, other school. Don't let Masi Bambisani beat you now. What's the definition of a strong base? Any hand there, Asimakle? No hand yet, sir. Nothing. <laughs> All right. Well, as we can see on the screen, a strong base dissociates completely in solution to form a high concentration of OH minus ions. Okay. So, grade twelves, please remember these important definitions. Well, but well done, Masi Bambisani. You guys are doing fine, and all of you are doing well. Keep it up. Don't be shy. All right, now let's have a look at concentrated or diluted acids and bases. Now, how concentrated or diluted an acid or base may be is a measure of the amount of water that is present in the system. May I give you a little illustration here? Suppose on a hot summer's day, you go down to the shop and you buy Oros orange juice in a bottle, all right? Now, that Oros bottle that you buy, you're gonna take home, you're gonna take a little bit of Oros in a glass and you're gonna fill it up with water, right? In other words, you're gonna dilute it. I'm sure you've had the experience, just like I've done, is you've been inquisitive and you've tried to taste that Oros. It is so strong. 
right? You probably even choked on that. Now, that strong taste, that choking, the reason why that happened is because it's so concentrated, right? So what you had to do to that orat is to dilute it. And you know, sometimes even when you dilute it with water, it's still so sweet that you have to dilute it even more. Well, what do we mean by concentrated and dilute? Look at the diagram here. Here we have the more concentrated. Do you notice there we have the hydrogen plus ion? all over in a small volume and look at the less concentrated now there's more volume and those hydrogen plus ions are almost free to move right so this brings us to our definition the acid or base strength must not be confused with concentration which refers to the amount of base or acid with a certain volume of solution, right? As defined by the number of moles per unit volume. No. How do we identify that? Well, a concentrated acid, right? And a dilute acid right? need to be separate from what we know as strong and weak acids. So how do we identify strong and weak acids? Well, when acids are dissolved in water, they ionize according to the following general equation. There we have it, HA plus H2O. There we have a reversible reaction. That gives rise to the H3O plus ion plus the A minus anion. Right. We've established that in our program this morning. The equilibrium constant. Now we're back in term two, grade 12s, when we did chemical equilibrium. You remember that? The equilibrium constant, remember that's the Kc value. This is given by, if you look at that reaction, right? You take the concentration of your products. So look at the products there. H3O plus, concentration of that, plus the A minus over HA. So why do we leave the water out? Because the water is a liquid. And as you know, from the Kc expression, all solids and liquids are assigned the value 1, or we leave them out of the equation. You got that? Only aqueous solutions and gases are allowed to play off in the Kc formula. And that now, instead of saying Kc, equilibrium constant, we call that the Ka very important designation there and the ka is what we refer to as the ionization constant of an acid can you see how we're using the equilibrium constant terms and now we're refashioning them according to acids and bases so as this equilibrium is focused on acids kc becomes ka which is the ionization constant of an acid for a strong acid, in other words, when acid ionizes completely, the Ka value is very high. In other words, it's greater than positive 1. This is because the denominator concentration of HA is low, and the numerator concentration right, of the product of the numerators is very, very high. Hence, it's much, much greater than 1. Now, for a weak acid, this is an acid, as you know, that ionizes partially in solution. The Ka value is low. In other words, it's less than one. This is because the denominator concentration is very high and the numerator concentration is low. There we go. All right. What about strong and weak bases? Well, when bases are dissolved in water, they disassociate according to the general equation. B standing for base plus H2, there's the water, and that goes to reversible reaction, BH plus, plus OH minus, remember, produces hydroxide ions in solution. So we take that further. What is the equilibrium constant for this? Well, if we take that same situation, remember the Kc constant is the concentration of the products divided by the concentration of the reactants. Once again, the products are BH plus, 
OH minus, the concentrations of those, and the B is the only thing that's aqueous. The H2 is a liquid, so it's assigned the number one, and the KB value, that's known as the ionization constant of a base. Have we got that grade 12s? So here's two new concepts that we've spoken about now. We just had in the previous slide the ionization constant of an acid, which is the Ka value, and now we've got the ionization constant of a base, which is a Kb value. And there we have it. So for a strong base, this is where bases dissociate completely. The Kb value is high. In other words, it's greater than 1. This is because the denominator concentration, that's the concentration of B, is low, and the numerator concentration, the product of, the, of those products, is very high. And then also, for a weak base, where the bases dissociate partially, the KB value is low. In other words, it's less than one. This is because the, denator, the denominator concentration of the base is high, and the numerator concentration of the um, BH plus plus OH minus is very low. All right, so that's how we identify strong bases and weak bases. In the previous slide, strong acids and weak acids. <clears throat> now we come to the equilibrium constant for water. Water is this amazing substance. We can't live without water, as you know. But from a chemistry point of view, it is such a fascinating substance. Water is an ampholite. We've established that in our program this morning already because it's able to react and to act both as an acid as well as a base. Two water molecules can undergo autoprotolysis. Do we notice that? Autoprotolysis or autoionization. Remember, auto means by itself. Autoionization or autoprotolysis where two molecules react with one another and where one acts as an acid, that's the H plus ion, and the other as a base. In other words, it becomes a proton acceptor. So look at the reaction that we have there. There we have water in its liquid format plus another water in its liquid format. That goes to H3O plus ion plus OH minus. Well, we recognize both and everything there. So if we have to look at the equilibrium constant. Remember, the Kc constant is the concentration of the products divided by the concentration of the reactants. In this case, the products are H3O plus and OH minus, and both of them are aqueous, so they go to the numerator. What about the denominator? Well, the denominator is 1. Why is the denominator 1? Because on the left-hand side of the equation, we have two substances that are in the liquid phase. And as you know, liquids and solids are assigned the number one in the Kc expression. And that's why the ionization constant of water is the concentration of the hydronium ion multiplied by the concentration of the hydroxide ion. And we call that now the KW value. So we move away from KC, we move to KW. So remember, we had KA for the ionization constant of an acid. KB, the ionization constant of a base. Now we have KW, the ionization constant of water. Very important. And so as this equilibrium is focused only on the auto-ionization of water, the Kc now becomes Kw, which is the ionization constant of water. And in pure water, the concentration of the hydronium ion, the H3O plus ion, is 1 times 10 to the minus 7 mole per cubic decimeter. Remember, that's the SI unit for concentration, mole per cubic decimeter. And the concentration of the hydroxide ion is 1 times 7, 1 times 10 to the minus 7 mole per cubic decimeter. When we combine them, well, we're going to get 1 times 10 to the minus 14 power at room temperature. 
That's the KW. And you'll notice that that particular formula is on your formula sheet, your information sheet. Okay. So the auto ionization process of water is weak, as evident by the extremely low value of 1 times 10 to the minus 40. I mean, there are so many zeros before the 1, and it's 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, like that. And that's why it's so weak, the auto ionization process of water. This brings us to the pH scale. And maybe you started thinking 10 to the minus 14. That number 14 in chemistry is very, very important. You know, many people make a fuss about this number 13. They say 13 is an unlucky number. All right. What about 14? Well, the pH scale. Here we have it. Due to the low concentration of the hydroxide and hydronium ions, it is simpler to refer to the negative logarithm, which allows us to work with whole numbers. Now, there we have a mathematical term, logarithm. You remember that? Yes. From grade 12 mathematics. John Napier, Scotland. Remember that? He did extensive studies with exponents, and he found out that the inverse of an exponent is a logarithm. And that's why in grade 12 mathematics, you have the exponential graph. You remember that? And its inverse function, its inverse graph for that matter, is the log graph. You know that. Right? And even in algebra, if you're calculating something, if you have something that is an exponent, you revert to the world of logs, logarithms. Even in financial mathematics, right? there you have logarithms playing off because exponents are there, calculating the number of years of a certain investment or certain annuity, future value or present value annuity. So logarithms are all part and parcel of the sciences. There's no doubt about that because they are linked to exponents. And we're talking about exponents because we've just established that the ionization constant of water is 1 times 10 to the minus 14 power. There's our exponent. So we need to talk about this. The pH scale ranges from 0 to 14 and indicates the degree of acidity or alkalinity of a solution. Have you got that grade 12? The pH scale, this is in the examination guidelines, is a scale of numbers ranging from 0 to 14, and it indicates the degree of acidity or alkalinity of a solution. And so here we have a very nice table that shows us. In an acidic solution, notice the concentration of the hydronium ions is greater than the concentration of the hydroxide ions. Hence, the concentration of the hydronium ions is greater than 1 times 10 to the minus 7. What about a neutral solution? Well, the concentration of the hydronium ions is equal to the concentration of the hydroxide ions. And therefore, concentration of the H3O plus ion is equal to 1 times 10 to the minus 7. For an alkaline solution or basic solution, the concentration of the hydronium ion is less than the concentration of the hydroxide ion. And therefore, Concentration of the hydro of the hydronium ion is less than one times ten to the minus seven. Now all of this plays off very nicely. You may notice on the right hand side of the screen, here we have all sorts of compounds and their pH values. Notice battery acid has a pH of zero, lemon juice has a pH of two, grapefruit three. Fruit. Imagine that. That's quite nice. Soft drinking water. There we go. Look at number six, pH of six, urine and saliva. You know, that's why when you go to a doctor, they often ask you to take a urine test. You know why they do that? Because they take litmus paper and they test to see whether your body fluids are acidic or alkaline. And they can from that, deduce what's really happening inside your body. 
All right, so that's how they use it there. There we have baking soda, number nine, ammonia solution, number 11, and so the story goes. Okay, very, very interesting. Now, pH calculations. Use the equation. pH is equal to minus log the concentration of H3O+. Plus. Once again, this is on your formula sheet or your information sheet. When the concentration of a base is known, the concentration of the hydronium ions should first be determined. Notice, when you know the concentration of your base, you must then know your concentration of, you must then calculate your concentration of the hydronium ions using the following equation. H3O, concentration of H3O plus, multiply with the concentration of OH minus, that is equal to 1 times 10 to the minus 14. And then you very easily substitute and you find out your concentration of your hydronium ion. You'll notice how this will play off in our worksheet that we're going to take up soon. Let's now talk of indicators, right? This is also another important part of our program. This is here, very important. <clears throat> An indicator is a substance that changes color in the presence of an acid or a base. Litmus turns red or pink in an acidic solution and blue in a basic solution. I spoke about the litmus test when you go to a doctor. So in an acid, litmus turns red. In a base, litmus turns blue. Now there are three indicators that are very important in grade 12. Right? And maybe you're making notes there, and that's a very good thing. Just remember these three particular indicators. Methyl orange. Can you all say that? Methyl orange. The next one. Bromothymol blue. Say that again. Bromothymol blue. Well done. I heard you saying that loud and clear. Here's the last one. Phenolphthalein. Again, phenolphthalein. It's a nice name to give your first daughter, phenolphthalein. <laughs> All right. So, methyl orange. Now, what we need to do in our minds is have two columns, acid and base. Got that? Acid and base. Have you got those three indicators? Methyl orange, bromothymol blue, phenolphthalein. Now, remember these colors. Orange, yellow, yellow, blue, colorless, pink. Have you got the rhyme? Orange, yellow, yellow, blue, colorless, pink. Let's say it again. Orange, yellow, yellow, blue, colorless, pink. Faster. Orange, yellow, yellow, blue, colorless, pink. Let's say it again. Orange, yellow, yellow, blue, colorless, pink. What do we mean by that? Well, now let's look at the outlay. Methyl orange in an acid has the color orange. In a base, it changes to yellow, or the color is yellow. What is the pH range? Well, 3.1 or 3,1 to 4,4. That's methyl orange. Remember? Orange, yellow. Acid base, orange, yellow. What about bromothymol blue? In an acid, bromothymol blue is yellow. In a base, it is blue. What is the pH range? From 6 to 7.6. What about phenolphthalein? Well, it is colorless in an acid and pink in a base. Beautiful. And that is something that is dealt with in grade 12 in a practical investigation called a titration. And you'll notice the following slides talk about that. And the pH range there is from 8.3 to 10. So let's now talk about titrations, very important. Titrations is an experimental technique used to determine the concentration of an acid or a base using a standard solution. Using volumetric analysis, the unknown concentration of an acid, right, of a solution, whether it's acid or a base, may be determined. 
And so we use the following equation. You remember in grade 10, you learn four equations in connection with calculating the number of moles. And one of those equations was the concentration is equal to the number of moles divided by the volume. You remember that? Now we refashion this. Remember that the number of moles can be calculated using the mass of a substance and its molar mass. You remember this equation too from grade 10. N, the number of moles, is equal to small m, that's the given mass, divided by the molar mass, which is what we find in the periodic table from the atomic mass. And so the titration formula now combines both of them. Look at that first formula. There you have C is equal to N over V. From that formula, if you have to make N the subject of the formula, you're going to have, you're going to cross product. You're going to have CV is equal to N. So if you're dealing with the acids and the bases, you're going to have the following formula. The concentration of the acid multiplied by the volume of the acid, that's in the numerator. And over the equal to sign, you're going to have the number of moles of the acid. So all the acids are in the numerator, divided by the concentration of the base, multiplied by the volume of the base, is equal to the number of moles of the base. That's how we find the concentration of an acid or a base in a standard solution, using that particular formula there. Very important. What we need to remember is we must write down the balanced equation. Next, we must identify the acid or the base. Very, very important. And then we must use the mole ratio. Remember, that's the number that stands in front of our chemical compound. And there we take it. So what are the indicators used during titrations? We've dealt with them before. The equivalence point of a titration is the point at which an acid or a base has reacted completely with the base or the acid. The end point of a titration is where the indicator changes color. You remember the indicators there, right? Our three indicators, you remember them again? Methyl, orange, you remember that, right? Then bromothymol blue, then phenolphthalein. Remember the colors? Yes, I can hear you saying them. Orange to yellow, right? You remember that? Yellow to blue. Then colorless to pink acid base. Very important. Commit that to memory. You must memorize these things. And so there we have our indicators. As we said, methyl orange, bromothymol blue, and their phenolphthalein. All right? So when you are dealing with a strong acid and a weak base, you're going to use the best indicator for that, and that is methyl orange, right? Because you want to get the best results. What about when you have a strong acid plus a strong base? In other words, we're talking about a situation now where we react, for example, hydrochloric acid with sodium hydroxide. Strong acid and strong base. You're going to use bromothymol blue. Then in grade 12, the practical investigation, you're going to take oxalic acid, which is a weak acid, and you're going to titrate that against sodium hydroxide. That's a strong base. You're going to use the indicator phenolphthalein. You'll notice it looks colorless. It looks like water. That's what colorless means here. Yeah. And then it changes to pink. One of the most amazing moments in chemistry. right? And that indicates that it's a base. All right, how are you doing? <laughs> are you exhausted? <laughs> no, I'm sure you're not. Let me ask you a couple of questions. How would you define an acid according to the lowry bronsted theory? What would you say? Put up your hands. I say, Martley, I'm relying on you. If you see your hand, an acid according to the lowry bronsted or bronsted lowry theory. An acid. Anybody? No hand up, sir. But if you are too shy to speak, you can um, type your answer in the chat. Yes. 
That's a good idea. All right. And okay. So remember, we said that an acid is a proton donor. You remember that? I'm sure you got Okay. And a base is a proton acceptor. Okay. What we want to do now, grade 12s, is we want to go into our worksheet. Okay. I already gave you the answer to 7.1. Okay. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to give you a few minutes now. Okay. Because we've gone through a lot of theory. All right. And I'd like you to engage with these questions. Okay. Uh, I'm going to check and see how you're doing. Okay. So please try. You got your worksheet there. We have many, many questions. But the bottom line is we want you to come to a proper understanding of this as well. Okay, so let's see how you do in connection with this here. Okay, remember the acid in terms of the lowry bronsted theory and so on. Okay, and then we'll go through. Sorry. There's another laptop if Pelele. I'm gonna sell it. All right, grade 12s, let me jog you on a little bit. Let's see how you're doing. Look at question 7.1 there, all right? Let's just take it further from there. Question 7.1 says, <clears throat> define an acid in terms of the lowry bronsted theory. What did you write? I'm sure you wrote this, an acid is a proton donor, right? You'll get two marks for that. If you wrote H3O plus ion donor, you'll also get two marks, as well as the H plus donor. All right, so any one of those options will be honored. Well done. Keep it up. Nice. Let's move on. Look at this next part. 7.2. Carbonated water is an aqueous solution of carbonic acid H2CO3. Now, let me just stop there. Carbonic acid. Do you know that this is the acid that is found in all our soft drinks like Coca Cola, Fanta, Sprite, Mountain Dew? And in the States, they have this thing called Dr. Pepper. I think they had it here for a while as well. Okay. So you have carbonic acid, right? And maybe you've had the experience of where you're drinking a Coca-Cola and the acid just like almost forms up in your head and so on. So the acid in all our soft drinks is called carbonic acid. The chemical formula there is H2CO3. Now, H2CO3 aqueous ionizes in two steps when it dissolves in water. Notice we're talking of ionization. Remember from our program this morning, that's when the hydrogen ions Chip away one by one. So 7.2.1 says, write down the formula of the conjugate base of H2CO3. In other words, if we had to take one hydrogen away from that, what would the conjugate base be? Well, there we'll have that. Notice that. 
the conjugate base of H2CO3 aqueous solution will be CO32 minus. Write down a balanced equation for the first step of the ionization of carbonic acid. There we have it. Notice 7.2.2, the first step where the one hydrogen breaks away, as I mentioned. We start with H2CO3 plus H2O, right? It's because it's dissolved in water. That's what the opening step showed us. Then we have our reversible reactions, and now we have the HCO3 minus aqueous plus the H3O plus aqueous. You got that? And of course, the second step would be when we take what's on the right-hand side and we take the hydrogen away, and there we come to the answer that we had in 7.2.1, where we have CO3 2 minus. Okay? That is the conjugate base of H2CO3 when all is said and done. And now, 7.2.3 says the pH of a carbonic acid solution at 25 degrees Celsius is 3,4. So it's within the acid belt. There's no doubt about that, right? It's close to zero. Calculate the hydroxide ion concentration in the solution. How do we do that? Notice one option is we say pH is equal to minus log concentration of H plus. Then we put the 3,4, that's our pH that's given, is equal to minus log concentration H plus. And of course, at that stage, we must multiply both sides by a negative, and then we're going to get minus 3,4. And of course, as you know, on the right-hand side, we're going to have log H plus. We know that every log is predicated to the base 10. And so when we kick the log away and push the minus 3, 4 up, we're going to have 10 to the minus 3, 4. And there's our answer. Or we can express that. The calculator will tell us 3,98 times 10 to the minus 4 mole per cubic decimeter. That's the concentration of the hydrogen ion. But we were asked in the question to find and calculate the concentration of the hydroxide ion. Grade 12, please remember in the matric exam, answer the question. Don't just leave it off like that. So now you need to take the second formula, which is the concentration of the hydrogen ion, multiply by the concentration of the hydroxide ion, that's equal to 10 to the minus 14, that's on your formula sheet. When you substitute into that formula, why your concentration of the hydroxide ions, as you can see, is 2,51 times 10 to the minus 11 mole per cubic decimeter. That is the SI unit for concentration. All right? Moving on with that question, here we have another option that can be given us there. Okay? You can also try it that way there. You can have a look at that. That's in the memorandum if you... Uh, search for this question in the uh, papers, you'll find it. Now, let's move to 7.3. Part of the same question, they tell us X is a monoprotic acid. They don't tell us what it is, they just say X. State the meaning of the term monoprotic. Well, monoprotic acids are acids that donate one proton, right, or one H3O plus ion, or one H plus ion, okay? So that is the definition of monoprotic. Diprotic, two ions. Triprotic, three ions. So an example of a monoprotic acid is hydrochloric acid, HCl. There's only one hydrogen there. An example of a diprotic acid, as you know, sulfuric acid, H2SO4. And an example of a triprotic acid is phosphoric acid, H3PO4. All right? So there we have that all cleared up for us. Now they tell us a sample of acid X is titrated with a standard sodium hydroxide solution using a suitable indicator. Sodium hydroxide, 
strong base, remember that? At the end point, it is found that 25 cubic centimeters of acid is neutralized by 27,5 cubic centimeters of sodium hydroxide solution of concentration 0,1 mole per cubic decimeter. Calculate the concentration of acid X. Grade 12, this is a very easy calculation. Please do not switch off in chemistry when it comes to these calculations. They are so simple. And you know, even if you don't get the final answer correct, you can gather so many marks along the way, right? You could get three out of five or four out of five, even if your solution is not correct. Remember, don't give up and don't give in. Remember, we're preparing you, many of you for that matter, for your onward advancement to university. And of course, maybe you've started thinking about careers, or maybe you haven't started thinking about careers. Don't forget, as the opening slide showed, on Friday at 11 o'clock, there's a career forum. As a reminder, this is an important announcement. Make sure that you attend that, just to hear how you can ensure that you're going in the right direction. Now, getting back to this question, how do we proceed in connection like this? Well, the first option that is given us is we take that titration formula. You remember we had CA times CV over CB times VB is equal to the number of moles of the acid over the number of moles of the base. We're looking for the concentration of the acid. There we have 25. We are given that value, cubic centimeters. There we have 0 0,1 mole per cubic decimeters for that concentration. We're given that. There we have 27,5. We're given that. And our mole ratio is 1 is to 1. There we have that. Okay? And so our concentration now amounts to 0 0,1 one mole per cubic decimeter. Maybe when you read that question, you thought to yourself, you know, I don't know where to start. I honestly don't know where to begin. Don't give up and don't give in. Just do what makes sense. It is that easy. And don't second guess your answers. You know, you could get an answer that could be spot on perfect. Don't score that out. Don't rule that out. Right? Don't cross it out. Leave it. That's very, very important. Okay? So don't give up and don't give in. Now, another option is given us there. Goes in another way. The memorandum offers that. Option one may be the easiest. All right, because the next option basically goes into different things. And then we are asked in 7.3.3, the concentration of the hydronium ions in the sample X is that is acid X a weak acid or strong acid? Explain your answer by referring to question 7.3.2. Well, it's a weak acid. I'm sure you got that. What is the reason? Because the concentration of the H plus or the hydronium ions, H3O plus, is lower than the concentration of acid X. Remember, this concentration here is 0 0.11. You remember the previous concentration that was calculated? This is much no. Therefore, the acid is completely ionized, which makes it a weak acid. Do you notice, grade 12, how the examination panel is testing whether we know our subject matter in connection with acids and bases? If we know the important principles that underpin acids and bases, we're going to do very, very well in the exam. And we know that you're going to do well, right? Don't give up. You can do this. Just plan your work, then work your plan. Let's take another question. I'm going to give you another few minutes for this, all right? This revolves around Ka values. You remember this point? The ionization constant of an acid. Have a look through this, and then we'll review it. All the best.
All right, grade twelves. Here we are. Let me interrupt you. Maybe we can have a, a few comments from uh, different schools. OK, please feel free. Notice question seven says the Ka value for two weak acids, namely oxalic acid and carbonic acid are as follows. There we see the names and the formulae. And then they tell us that the Ka value for oxalic acid is 5,6 times 10 to the minus 2. For carbonic acid, it's 4,3 times 10 to the minus 7. So the question there, define the term weak acid. Right? Would someone like to tell us what is the definition of a weak acid? Anybody, put up your hands or type your answer in the chat box. Get your two marks. How's that? I say, Markley, if you can tell me if there's a hand up, please. No hand up yet, sir, but I am waiting. Okay. What is the definition of a weak acid? Anybody? Nothing, Asimakle? Nothing, sir. Okay, all right. Well, a weak acid, as you may remember, is a substance that ionizes incompletely in solution. Or you can say to a small extent. All right, so that's the definition of a weak acid. Then we go to 7.2. Which acid, oxalic acid or carbonic acid, is stronger Give a reason for your answer. I can hear you saying it. Yes, the weaker, the stronger acid, right, is oxalic acid. What's the reason for that? Because it has a higher Ka value. All right. So obviously carbonic acid is the weaker acid because it has a lower value. All right. <clears throat> now. Let's go to 7.3. Oxalic acid ionizes in water according to the following balanced equation. There we have COOH, brackets two, that's a solid, plus two moles of water, that's a liquid, and that goes to COO2, two minus aqueous, plus two moles of H3O plus aqueous. Write down the formulae of the two bases in this equation. Do you notice the first one that's given? Water is a base. So there's the first one. All right. And then C double O two two minus. That is the conjugate base of the other one there as well. So those are the bases there. All right. Very, very important. Okay. So there we have that. Moving on, we have uh, the next question. 7.4. Learners prepare two cubic decimeters of sodium hydroxide solution of concentration 0,1 mole per cubic decimeter. Notice we are given a volume and we're given a concentration. Right. So we are asked to calculate the pH of the solution. Well, notice how we approach that. One of the ways we can do that is to say Kw, the ionization constant of water, is equal to the OH minus multiplied by the H3O plus concentration. So those concentrations. We know KW from the formula sheet has a value of 1 times 10 to the minus 14. We are given the concentration 0, 0,1 of sodium hydroxide, right? And so then we can find the concentration of the hydronium ion, which is 1 times 10 to the minus 13 when we put that into the calculator. Then we take that and put it into the pH is equal to minus log concentration of H3O plus formula. And then we get our answer. The pH is 13. And that is spot on because we know that sodium hydroxide is a strong base. Hence, a pH of 13 is another indication that our answer is absolutely correct. Uh, not just in the ballpark, 
but spot on correct. All right, very important. Now, 7.5 says, during a titration. Now, when we see that word, we already must start use, thinking in terms of the titration formula. The sodium hydroxide solution in question 7.4, notice the scaffolding of the answer that is being used in 7.5. That's a basis. The foundation is going to be used. With a dilute oxalic acid, right? So sodium hydroxide is titrated with dilute oxalic acid. Once again, a strong base and a weak acid. Okay? The learners find that 25,1 cubic centimeters of sodium hydroxide neutralizes exactly 14,2 cubic centimeters of oxalic acid. And there's a formula there, CWH brackets 2. The balanced equation for the reaction is as follows. Now notice grade 12s. Look at the mole ratio for this reaction. Can you see the mole ratio? We have two moles of sodium hydroxide plus one mole of oxalic acid goes to one mole of sodium oxalate and two moles of water, right? So what is the mole ratio of this reaction? I can hear you saying it. I can hear. Two is to one is to one is to two. In other words, two mole is to one mole is to one mole is to two mole. We are asked now, 7.5.1, calculate the concentration of the oxalic acid solution. That's a very nice question. Very easy. The biggest giveaway was that word titration. So we take the titration formula. CA times VA over CB times VB is equal to NA over NB. And we substitute into that formula. It's as simple as that. Imagine five marks for that. Wow, that's amazing. So then we have CA, and then we have 14,2. That's our volume. And then we have 0,1. That's also given from the previous one. Remember, we got that. And then now here we have 25,1. And there we have 1 is to 2. Now, 1 is to 2 comes from the mole ratio. Notice the base, right? The base there is 2. There are 2 moles there. And the acid, there's 1 mole there, right? 2 moles of sodium hydroxide, 1 mole of um, oxalic acid. That's why we have 1 over 2. Final answer, the concentration is 0, 0,09 mole per cubic decimeter. Grade 12s, you can do this. There's no doubt about that. Don't give up. Don't give in. You're doing so well. Just keep moving forward. Right? Now, another option that the memorandum offers, right? You may also want to try this. The titration formula, as you've seen, takes us straight to the solution. Right? So there's no beating about the bush. It goes right there. The bottom line is you'll get your answer 0, 0,09. And then, finally, which one of the indicators above is most suitable for this titration? Well, it's obviously C. Right? And remember phenolphthalein. Remember that? From colorless to pink. It's colorless in an acid and pink in a base. All right? So the titration of a weak acid and a strong base you may remember from a previous slide, is indicator C. And if they want to know which indicator is that, well, we write there, phenolphthalein, right? There we go. And as you can see, it's an, op it's an option that's given us there. All right, so well done. How did you do with your 17 mark? I'm sure you scored 17 out of 17. Let's move forward. We've got another very interesting question. Remember, all of these questions are drawn from past national senior certificate papers grade 12 make sure that your intensive revision involves going through past examination papers you see by going through these papers you are preparing yourself for the future you're getting an idea as to how the question is asked you're not learning the question you're not learning the answer but you are understanding how the question is asked in an exam all right and, you know, by researching the memorandum, you're gaining an understanding as to how the marks are awarded. 
In fact, you're given the opportunity to look at another way of reasoning, something that may appeal to you and that may click even at this late stage in your development. So make sure you become an independent researcher, right? And if you're working in a study group, well done. Keep intensifying your program. Let's move to our next question. Very interesting. Once again, I'm going to give you a few minutes and we'll take it from here. Um, sorry, Mr. Goldstone. Yes. Aha. There's a question from yes. Michalim Zamo. Oh, and right. the yes. question is, <laughs> and the question is, does H3O plus have a constant number that you replace it with when calculating the pH value? Yes. Good morning, Michalim and Zamo. Nice hearing from you. And I expected that question from you. I know them very well. Uh, yes, the concentration of, as was mentioned in a previous slide, uh, Michlali and Mzamo, the ionization constant of water is 1 times 10 to the minus 14. You guys got that? I'm sure. Now, the ionization constant is made up of two concentrations. The first one is H3O plus concentration of that, and the next one is OH minus, right? So the concentration of H3O plus is 1 times 10 to the minus 7, and the concentration of OH minus is 1 times 10 to the minus 7. When you multiply those two, as you know, you're going to get the product 1 times 10 to the minus 14, all right? So that is the stated principle that's there. However, we have to look at the question, right? And what the question actually says in connection with what we are calculating. So if we are not given anything, well, then we go that route. If we are given definite, then we go the route the way the question is dictating. Does that help you guys? Okay. Uh, Michali says yes, sir. Okay, great. Um, Michali and Mzamo, you may also want to check the answer series has got a very nice discussion of this. Okay, there's further detail in there, as well as Science Clinic, you know, under the ionization constant of water. So you may want to check further information. I know you guys are interesting researchers there. And so just keep going. Well done. Excellent. That's a great question. I expected that from you guys. Well done. <laughs> All right. I see there's another question from Alistair. Is that correct, um, um, Asim Ahle? Uh, no, sir. Okay. Um, there's an Alison, Alistair. Oh, oh, I see. Oh, okay, okay. No, no, no. I see. I see. I see. I see. <laughs> okay. 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 Great. All right. So I'll give you guys a few more minutes, and then uh, we will take it further from here.
All right, how are we doing? I'm sure you're conquering. Right, now notice this question here. This question says, the balanced equation below represents the first step in the ionization of sulfuric acid in water. Just a couple of points. Sulfuric acid, you may remember from our program this morning. Sulfuric acid is a diprotic acid, remember? Because it's got two hydrogens. You may also remember I reminded you, something you know, that sulfuric acid occurs in a car's battery, a vehicle battery, all right? And it is a strong acid, don't forget that. So the minute you start seeing these terms, you know, all this knowledge must flood to your mind, right? Remember, you're gonna be the engineers, you're gonna be the doctors, you're gonna be the accountants, you're gonna be the professionals of the future. Everything that is mentioned in these questions takes on shape. Right? It's important that you diagnose exactly what you're told. Notice we haven't even gone further in the question, but already we're filling our minds with a lot of information. We're brainstorming the question as it is. So look at the reaction. The reaction is, there we have it, H2SO4 liquid plus H2O liquid, that's sulfuric acid diluted in water, all right, in a sense. There we have H3O plus aqueous, HSO4 minus. But notice now, the opening statement called attention to the ionization of sulfuric acid. So question 7.1.1 says, write down the formula, notice, not the name, the formula of the two bases in the equation. What did you write down? Well, there we go. The first one is water, and the second one is HSO4 minus. Those are the formulae of the two bases in that equation. What about 7.1.2? Is sulfuric acid a strong, or, oh, I can hear you saying it. I can hear you shouting it. <laughs> You're right. Yeah, it's a strong acid. Why is it a strong acid? Because it completely ionizes in water. Please don't say it dissociates. It ionizes completely in water. All right? So there we've got four marks already. Two for 7.1.1 and two for 7.1.2. Now we come to our calculations part. Watch carefully. Let me see if you'll be able to handle this. Very, very easy. Learners, Use the reaction of a 0,15 mole per cubic decimeter sulfuric acid solution with a sodium hydroxide solution in two different experiments. Okay? The balanced equation is as follows. H2SO4 plus two moles of NaOH goes to N2, Na2SO4, that's your sodium sulfate, plus your water. Just look at that reaction. You have aqueous, 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 and liquid. Is that a homogeneous reaction or a heterogeneous reaction? I can hear you saying it. It's a heterogeneous reaction. Well done. Why? Because the phases, of the reactants and the products are not all the same. There's a liquid there, but everything else is aqueous. What is the mole ratio for that balanced equation? One mole to two mole is to one mole is to one mole. That's an important concept. Don't forget that. <clears throat> that was building on what we learned in grade 10 and grade 11. Now, question 7.2.1 <clears throat> says, the learners use 24 cubic centimeters of sulfuric acid in a titration to neutralize 26 cubic centimeters of sodium hydroxide. Calculate the concentration of sodium hydroxide. Remember now, the mole ratio for sulfuric acid is one, right? The number of moles is one. The number of moles 
sodium hydroxide is two. We can see that from the balance equation. So how do we proceed from here? Well, we use the formula, as you can see in option number one. Just focus on option number one. I think that's the easiest equation that will take you places. CA times VA over CB times VB is equal to N over A. There's your 0, 0,15. We are told that that is the concentration of the sulfuric acid. <laughs> the volume of that acid, we are also told, is 24. There you see it, multiplied by 24. Then the concentration of the base, well, we're looking for that. All right, that's what the question is all about. <laughs> so we don't have a value for that. That's why we say CB. Multiply by the volume, and that is given us in 7.2.1. That volume is 26 cubic centimeters. And the mole ratio, number of moles of the acid, the acid is one, we can see that from the balanced equation, one mole of sulfuric acid divided by two moles of sodium hydroxide. When we cross product, find the concentration of sodium hydroxide, we have an answer of 0, 0,28 mole per cubic decimeter. You must put that SI unit there as well. There's a second option that's given us there, not a problem, but anyway, that's it's also another way of reasoning it out. I personally find that the titration formula is the way to go. It's simple, everything fits in, and you can work out whatever you want to. Now, just on this point, sulfuric acid, you may remember from our program this morning, by way of review, is a strong acid. And sodium hydroxide, is a strong base. Do you remember the indicator that could be used for a strong acid and a strong base? It was the second. Yes, I can hear you saying it. Bromothymol blue. Yes. Look, the question is not there. I'm just doing a bit of an oral exam with you, right? Bromothymol blue. And you remember we have the columns acid and base? Bromothymol blue in an acid is yellow, in a base it's blue, right? So keep that in mind, because you never know. It could come up in the final examination, you never know, maybe even in your preliminary examination. So keep revising these important points. Now, question 7.2.2. In another experiment, 30 cubic centimeters of sulfuric acid is added to 20 cubic centimeters of a 0, 0,28 mole per cubic decimeter sodium hydroxide solution in a beaker. Calculate the pH of the final solution. That's very, very easy. Now look, there could be many ways of reasoning this out, okay? And as you can see from the eight marks, eight marks does not mean that it's difficult. Eight marks just simply means you really have to reason things out. In other words, your answer is going to be spread out because you'll have to reason it out. It's not difficult. You just have to spread it out nicely. So the first thing we have to do is to find the number of moles of sodium hydroxide. If you look at option number one, the number of moles based on the formula C is equal to N over V. We're making N the subject of the formula. We take our 0, 0,02, right? Uh, mole, uh, mole per cubic decimeter, that's our concentration, and multiply that by 0, 0,28. Okay, can you see? 0, 0,28. And there we have that. Now, when we multiply that, we're going to get an answer of 0, 0,056. So that's for sodium hydroxide. You remember the 0, 0,2, 0, 0,02 came from the previous. Now, when we take the number of moles, if we have to find the number of moles of sulfuric acid, once again, very easy, right? We're going to take 0, 0,03 multiplied by 15, right? And there we're going to get 0, 0,045, all right? Are we all together? 0, 0,045. Now, we realize, according to the mole ratio, that there's one mole of sulfuric acid to two moles of sodium hydroxide. So in other words, we can express that and say, look, if you take sulfuric acid and place it alongside sodium hydroxide, it's 
a ratio of 1 is to 2, or in mathematical terms, a half. But once we get that, we must subtract that from the sulfuric acid that we got in the previous step, that is 0, 0,0045. And then we're going to get an important figure which we're going to carry forward, and that is the balance of 0, 0,0017 mole of sulfuric acid. When we take that and find the concentration of sulfuric acid now, using the formula C is equal to N over V, there you're going to have your 0, 0,0017 divided by the volume, right? Remember the volume there is 0, 0,05. There's our volume, important. And now we're going to get an answer of 0, 0,034 mole per cubic decimeter. Of course, we realize that sulfuric acid being an acid has got a concentration of hydronium ion, right? And so we recognize that because it's a diprotic acid, there must be two of them. So hence, that's why that two is next to the sulfuric acid in brackets. So we multiply it like that. If there was one, if it was, say, for example, hydrochloric acid, we would have one multiplied by HCl. Or if it was phosphoric acid, we would have a three multiplied by H3PO4. There we're going to get the answer of concentration of H3O plus is 0, 0.068 mole per cubic decimeter. Taking that into the last equation, which is the pH is equal to minus log concentration of H3O plus, we're going to get a pH value of 1,17. That is very acidic, as you know, because it's close to zero, all right? So that's the outlay of that particular question. Now, remember, in that question, <clears throat> the important thing here is to show how the sequencing went, and that's how you would get your eight marks. Grade 12s, you can do this. There's no doubt about that. If that has given you a bit of a hassle, maybe you need to wrap your mind around that, you have your worksheet, you have your solutions. This is online. It's a National Senior Certificate paper. Make sure you digest this. This is very, very important and very interesting as well. Notice the marking criteria above. It indicates how you're going to get the marks as you're going along. So don't give up. You could be right on track. There are learners who got total for this paper. You can be one of them as well. Believe in yourself. We believe in you. Let's go to our final question that we're going to work on today. All right? I'll give you a few minutes for this, and then we'll review. We're almost at the end of our program, so then we're going to take it from here. Okay? A few minutes, and then we'll review this. All right, grade 12s, I see we've got about two or so minutes left. Time has really caught us up. <laughs> You'll be able to work through the balance of this later on. Let's just take a few questions at the start. Notice it says there, a hydrogen bromide solution, HBr, reacts with water according to the following balanced chemical equation. There we have our HBr plus the water goes to Br minus aqueous, plus the H3O plus. The Ka value, remember that's the auto-ionization constant of the acid of HBr at 25 degrees Celsius is 1 times 10 to the ninth power. Question 7.1. Is hydrogen bromide a strong acid or a weak acid? Give a reason for your answer. 
Yes, it's a strong asset. Why? Because it has a high or a large Ka value. That's the reason. Okay, we are given the Ka value there. Then we're going to take just one more question before we round off. Write down the formulae for the two bases in the reaction above. Well, as you can see, water is one of the bases and Br minus is the other base. Okay, so you may have got that. The balance of the question is very easy. Once again, it revolves around calculating the pH and also using the titration calculations. So as you go through the different um, calculations, make sure that you are faithful to the principles that have been sketched. So what have we been saying in our program this morning? Grade 12's acids and bases is an important part of paper two. It's about 20 to 21, 20 to 22 marks in the National Senior Certificate. Make sure you go through your definitions. Make sure you know the various points in connection with acids, bases, indicators, titrations, the various terms. Very, very easy. Then also, make sure you know how to work with titration calculations. They're very easy. We've seen them this morning. And then your more ratio application which is bringing in your stoichiometry from grades 10 and grade 11 as well. And then your pH calculations. Remember, the Kw is equal to concentration of the H3O plus multiplied by the concentration of the OH minus. And then your pH is equal to minus log concentration of H3O plus. We thank you so much, grade 12s, for joining this physical science program. Remember, if details came too fast for you, there's going to be a recording that's going to be given to you for you to digest at your leisure. In everything you do, don't give up and don't give in. Plan your work, then work your plan. All the best for your preliminary exam and your final exam, and enjoy the program on Friday where you'll be able to look at careers that open up because of the gateway subject of physical sciences. Take good care, stay safe, and stay healthy. Bye-bye.